This program is made possible by the members and donors to the show, so a huge thanks to everyone who contributes on Patreon to support the show. And now, welcome to this episode of the award-winning Best of the Left podcast, in which we shall learn about the movement behind the anti-government, pro-wealthy campaign to remake America that dates back much farther than the Koch brothers. Clips today come from In Deep with Angie Coiro, This Is Hell, The Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and The Tom Hartman Program. Let's talk about how this influence was mapped out and how it grew. If you can take us through the growth of first the think tanks and then the chairs and the grants to schools, the universities, the generosity most recently to the NAACP or the black universities. Let's talk about how that was grown. Okay. One of the things that interested me was that As recently as 1980, the Kochs were considered so far out on the fringe of American politics that William F. Buckley described their kind of politics as anarcho-totalitarianism, the father of the modern conservative movement just casting them aside as kind of almost kooks. And in 1980, Charles Koch got his younger brother David to run on the libertarian ticket as vice president against Ronald Reagan, who was running for president in 1980, because the Kochs thought Reagan was too liberal. They thought he was a sellout, and they had a a more right-wing vision. They got nowhere. So they tried the sort of traditional method of getting power in the United States, which is running for office, and it wasn't working. And after that, they gave it a lot of thought, and they decided that politicians are just actors, as they put it, And that instead of trying to be actors or fund the actors, they wanted to write the script, as they put it. So what they did was they thought about how do you write the script of politics in America? Well, you have to change academia, you have to change the press, and you have to create your own sort of alternative facts. And so they started funding think tanks and programs in universities and fake grassroots movements so that they created pressure out on the streets for the things that they believed in, and um, put this all together as it built up kind of a machine that is now formidable. I mean, there was a a, uh, paper that was done by two professors at Harvard not long ago that described it as a machine that the Kochs fund that is a rival, if not more powerful, than the Republican Party, Mm -hmm. um, and kind of taking over the Republican Party. They now have an organization, Americans for Prosperity, that's in 35 states, They hire more political operatives than the Republican National Committee does. And they have gotten to the point where they don't just fund it themselves. They have a group of funders that they bring together. Some 400 and 450 of the richest conservatives in the country pool their resources and fund this project. They've built it up like they've built up their business. Both Charles and David Koch are graduates of MIT and engineers, and they kind of looked at American politics as an engineer might. How do you, where are the widgets that you can turn to create the process that'll bring you what you want? And they've built it. In the wake of Citizens United, I think a lot of Americans are aware of how messaging impacts elections. But I think for a lot of us, we don't think past the elections. And when you're talking about creating a machinery that changes ideas, the elections are kind of a pit stop or kind of a barometer. Along the way, you're going to want to influence elections. But most of all, you're trying to influence a mentality that lasts generations beyond elections. Right. They really had the long view. And I think if you want to fault the liberals or the Democratic Party, you can say that they've been short-sighted. They go sort of election cycle to election cycle. You know, there are exceptions. But for the most part, they've been funneling their money into campaign contributions. On the right, meanwhile, they've been building a lasting sort of ideological machine to take on, you know, what used to be a liberal consensus in the country, or at least a sort of a... There was a consensus when the Kochs began that government was a good thing and that there was such a thing as a public sphere that was important, Mm -hmm. and that uh, social services and a social safety net were a good thing and necessary. And they have been fighting it and tearing at it and attacking it from all these directions at once. And if you have to boil down their message to the most simplistic form, it's an anti-government message, Mm -hmm. basically. And, And look where we are now. 
that worldview prevails in the Republican Party. It didn't when they began. There was even bipartisan support for the environmental movement when Nixon was president. Well, it's, that's a good, for instance, is if we take the messaging on climate change, if you were to say flat out, you know, here is Coke Incorporated, the large Coke machine, and they are one of the biggest producers of waste and pollution in the world. And we want you to listen to them about global warming and, and pollution and the environment. Everybody would just say no. But the way the message has been massaged throughout, it's no longer really associated with them per se. So can you take a message That's like a very climate good, change? And a very good point. And I think that part of what interested me about them was that they were so covert. The first story I wrote on the Cokes in The New Yorker in 2010 was called Covert Operations. And they were so under the radar, you could barely see their money, you know, and it was very hard to trace it. And so why were they so secretive about it? Well, I think that they knew... That, as you say, if you knew that the major force that was saying global climate change is not real were the people who benefit most from carbon pollution, you might say, ah, well, of course they're saying that, and I don't believe it. it. It undercuts their own credibility. But by hiding the money trail, they've been able to get a lot more traction. So instead, what they do is they fund denialism. There's a, a tremendous amount of money that's gone into think tanks that turn out papers that say that there's doubt about whether global warming is real. And even if it is real, maybe it's not caused by humans. And if it's real and caused by humans, maybe it's a great thing. There are even these papers that I've read that suggest that, you know, it'll bring us a better time when there'll be more arable land. And one of the most appalling things, actually, <laughs> that I came across was at the Smithsonian in Washington, there was a, a big exhibit that was funded by David Koch, and it had a game that kids could play about how people adapt. And it said, maybe if there's global warming people will start to get smaller and sort of bend over and they can live underground. Um, and, and, and I thought, oh, God, this is really not the message you want to give your kids, you know. But, um, but this is the thing. There it is at the Smithsonian, and it's funded in an exhibit by David Koch. And there are think tanks all over the place spewing out this message. And take a look at our Congress. It is now dominated by Republicans in both the House and the Senate who refuse to admit that climate change is real. And you have someone at the head of the EPA who is saying that climate change is not, he doesn't necessarily believe that it's real or that it's caused by humans. That is such a minority view, even in this country at this point. It's not a democratically decided opinion. It's an opinion decided by big money. A mm -hmm. number of people are asking about the connections between the Kochs and Donald Trump. They didn't immediately take a liking to each other. But now they seem to be getting along a little bit better. Can you track that for us? There's a little bit of a rapprochement. They're not really made for each other, I don't think. <laughs> but, uh, uh, they're both very strong-minded in their own way. And the truth is that the... The Koch family looked at 2016 as what was going to be its crowning glory. They had by then built this huge machine all across the country, and they had set aside $889 million to spend in the 2016 election cycle, which is just an unheard of amount of money. It was coming from themselves and this group of 400 or 450 other multimillionaires and billionaires. So they thought it was their moment. And they were going to wait till there was a Republican nominee and then help get him elected and defeat Hillary Clinton. But of all the possible Republican nominees, the <laughs> one guy who they really didn't like won the nomination. And so they were stuck and they didn't know what to do. And despite the fact that we tend to think of them as all-knowing and, you know, pulling all the levers, in fact, they're often in disarray, and they really weren't sure what they were going to do. And they thought that Hillary Clinton was going to be elected, and they got afraid about how much they could oppose her because they were going to have to work with her, and they have the second largest private company in America. So they aimed all of their efforts at taking over Congress, and they put money into, I think it's 42 House races and 19 Senate races. They won most of them. And the Freedom Caucus that you hear about in Congress could easily be called the Koch Caucus. They have elected so many of those members. But they're stuck with Donald Trump. And he actually made fun of them. 
when all of his rivals in the uh, Republican primaries went to the Koch group to try to get money, he tweeted out, puppets, anyone? So he was, you know, definitely not paying respect to them in the form that they expected. You talk about the Kochs being in the background, and just recently in New Yorker, you profiled the Mercers, who are even further in the background and want nothing to do with any public profile at all. It's just interesting to watch the intermixing going on. Well, so the Mercers are, uh, Bob Mercer is a hedge fund gazillionaire. I'm not sure he's that he's actually a billionaire, but he's close. Uh, he makes about $135 million a year. And he was allied with the Kochs. He was part of their organization. But he and his daughter, Rebecca, she's in her 40s and, and pretty much the kind of the lead political person in the family. They got fed up with the Kochs because they didn't think they were winning enough after 2012. Um, they'd put a lot of money into the Koch group and they wanted Romney to be elected. And when he was defeated, they thought, we can do this better. So they're kind of like mini-me's of the Kochs. They've built up their own organization. And it, as of last August, they threw their weight and their money behind Trump. And so they've become the biggest money in some ways behind Trump. So you've got now rival billionaires, rogue billionaires warring each other a little bit. Um, you've got the Kochs who are pushing the Freedom Caucus and pushing the Republican Party way far to the right. And then you've got the Mercers who are with Trump. So they actually came to blows with each other a little bit over the health care bill because the Mercers were supporting Trump's version the Kochs were fighting it not because they thought it was a terrible thing to take health care benefits away from 21 million people, but because it didn't take enough away. They wanted to see big government completely wiped out, and they don't want any kind of health care program. So there's a fight on between the far, far right and the far right, basically, and, the, and billionaires behind both versions. doing your research, you didn't find some fancy Buchanan library with all his papers, despite the importance he has for the radical right in the U.S. Instead, you found Buchanan House on George Mason University's campus in Fairfax, Virginia, what you describe as a clapboard mansion, and the place is just filled, littered with his papers. You start digging through them. This is in 2013, shortly after mm -hmm. Buchanan's death. And as you write, they were in no discernible order, not knowing where to begin. I decided to proceed clockwise, starting with a pile of correspondence that was resting helter-skelter on a chair to the left of the door. I picked it up and began to read. It contained confidential letters from 1997 and 1998 concerning Charles Koch's investment of millions of dollars in Buchanan's Center for Study of Public Choice and a flare-up that followed. Catching my breath, I pulled up an empty chair and set to work. What is the guiding principle of Buchanan's public choice theory, and how does it have an impact on the thinking of today's radical right? <laughs> I'm glad that you chose that quote, because I could just share, as you were saying it, I was remembering it, and truly, my breath stopped. I had to tell myself, <laughs> breathe, breathe, breathe. Uh, so Buchanan came out, he was trained at the University of Chicago. He got his um, uh, PhD there in uh, economics, and right after the war, after he was um, getting out of the Navy. And so he was very much trained in that world. He was more, you know, for your people who get down on the weeds, more in the Hayek side than the Friedman side, but uh, definitely a University of Chicago economics product. But instead of looking at markets or making the case for markets, he had the understanding that the more radical and the more transformative uh, approach would be to look at government and to use his economics tools to look at government and public sector actors. And he wanted to destroy, basically, he wanted to undermine the notion, the very notion of a public uh, a public good, of the common good. Um, and his approach to doing that was to look at political actors and elected officials <coughs> as um, self-interested indiv uh, individuals seeking not the public good, but their own self-interest. So, for example, he explained, and he was also in public finance, right? So he's looking at um, taxation, spending, and the public sector. So he um, explained deficits by saying politicians 
basically want to get reelected. That's their self-interest. So they will agree to the demands put on them by multiple constituencies. Let's say, you know, uh, senior citizens want retirement programs, uh, labor unions want higher wages and better conditions, civil rights groups want enforcement of anti-discrimination law. All these things cost money, right? They, they, they take up tax revenues. They, they require spending. And, but because the politicians are not themselves paying for these things, they'll just keep spending, and that's how we get deficits. I mean, I'm making it kind of crude, but that was that was his fundamental idea. And from that, uh, from that kind of basic approach uh, of looking at the incentives in public life, he modeled people who made claims on government. He came to model them as predators um, and the uh, taxpayers as prey, and particularly the wealthier taxpayers, who he said were subject to discriminatory taxation. So he saw his task ultimately as protecting particularly the wealthiest in corporations from the claims of the rest of us, you know, whether we want um, uh, government agencies to get us clean air and water. And of course, that takes uh, time, you know, clean up like the Chicago River cleanup would be a case in point, you know, kind of an expensive uh, project. Um, uh, clean air and water, you know, we want retirement security, we want battered women's shelters, we want uh, 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 early childhood education, you know, all those kinds of things that many of us think of as ways to enhance our common life and give people a chance at economic security and hope for realizing their dreams. All of those things in the ideas of these this arch uh, libertarian right are threats to the economic, to the prerogatives of, of uh, property holders um, and to the, to the um, uh, they would say the productive, right? That, that you know now they use the language of job creators, but basically they're saying that uh, the things that democracies do threaten the bottom line or the liberty of uh, the wealthiest among us. So are uh, Buchanan's papers then a smoking gun of a plan or an outline for a radical right wing takeover of U.S. governance by billionaires set on rolling back our civil and democratic rights, setting those back even centuries? Uh, well, I wouldn't say, you know, it's not like there's a particular, like a document that says the plan, although Buchanan was involved very, very early on before any of our existing histories, you know, have, have recognized with trying to set up what he called a counterintelligentsia. And he did that working particularly with Ed Meese, um, who was Ronald Reagan's uh, chief of staff as governor um, and most trusted aide later on and a group of other people. So he was very early on trying to organize scholars, particularly uh, conservative uh, economists, in conjunction with businesses and corporations to create a kind of counterforce and change the public conversation. So he was doing that in a very uh, self-conscious way and with a very sequential plan that I talk about in the book. In terms of what has rolled out since, uh, it's a plan in the sense that it is all guided by his ideas about how to fundamentally change the power relations of our public life to make it so that this agenda that can go through. And so one of the things I point out in the book is, and the most important single thing to understand, I think, in this is that this is a self-consciously minority cause. They know through repeated experiences from the um, uh, electoral debacle of Barry Goldwater in 1964 forward, through the failure of Ronald Reagan to, to produce the radical change they wanted, through George W. Bush's ballooning of the deficit, this cause knows that it will never get what it wants by frontally and openly explaining its end game to the American people. So what they have done instead is to apply Buchanan's understanding of how public life operates, apply Buchanan's understanding to essentially um, debilitate their opponents and to change the rules. He always said we shouldn't focus on changing the rulers, but changing the rules. So they want to <clears throat> debilitate their opponents and change the rules so that they can achieve what they want. And I will give you some examples of that because I know that sounds abstract, but basically, you know, we've seen a surge in the last few years in right to work legislation in these um, states that are controlled by the, the radical wing of the Republican Party, you know, Wisconsin being the most, <clears throat> the most obvious. 
and the most dramatic, um, and not just right to work in the old style, but right to work with really diabolical rules. And if you look, you know, I'm not going to go into it now and take up too much time, but the legislation that Scott Walker uh, proposed, the approach that he proposed that was implemented, really was designed to destroy unions, to make it just absolutely impossible for them to operate with a series of very, very particular rules. So that is all Buchanan. I mean, his fingerprints of his approach are effectively on that. Another element that is crucial to this is voting rights. They have been very determined to suppress voting rights because they well understand that people who have lower incomes, and actually women, too, do not get on board for this agenda, and young people. And so they have tried with great precision and specificity uh, in the measures they've adopted to keep those people from the polls to, to over-represent, just as mid-century Virginia did, to over-represent the um, most conservative whites. Um, gerrymandering is another thing. I mean, this cause has taken gerrymandering to, to a degree never um, seen before in this country. And basically what it's meant is that our voting rights don't count because they have us packed into districts uh, that don't allow proper representation of people. And so you have a number of states, including my own uh, state of North Carolina or um, Pennsylvania is another one where even though the vast, the majority of people are voting for Democrats, the majority of those elected are Republicans. And that's because the way they drew the districts. So, I mean, we could go on and on, but there's a whole series of ways that Buchanan advocated these these very uh, well-considered rules changes to, again, debilitate those who would block this agenda and to over-represent the power of those who would support it. So, more than anything, even more than supporting capitalism over democracy— is Buchanan's focus on the individual over the collective? Is his major focus essentially the end of democracy? Uh, okay, let me let me just say two things. One is, I think it is very important here to say that this is, you know, there's capitalism and there's capitalism. There's all kinds of different capitalisms operating in the world, right? It's a it's a it's a fiction to say that there is something like the pure market that is ungoverned by public institutions because. Every society has, you know, creates markets, um, it regulates markets. So, and there are many capitalists, I think, who would be horrified by this agenda. You know, and we're seeing some of that with the Republican uh, dis- destruction of the Affordable Care Act, where many are the, you know, in the Paris Climate Accords, there are many business owners whose interests would be threatened by this agenda. There are many wealthy people who are appalled, would be appalled by this agenda. So so I don't want to uh, let, you know, the Buchanan and Koch, and I think of them as kind of Leninist libertarians, and they did study Lenin to, to devise this this approach, but um, that's another subject. But uh, I don't want them to have a monopoly, you know, on the notion that, that there's one form of capitalism and they're defending it. But in their minds, they're def- yes, they're defending capitalism from democracy. And um, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that they are about to, you know, bring out the troops and, and, you know, have a military government or something. I mean, that's not it at all. And I think, you know, Charles Koch, uh, I believe is in the rule of law, and he's very smart, I think. I mean, he's an extremely smart man. I think many on the left and many liberals have really underestimated how shrewd this guy is and how many moves ahead he thinks. But this cause does really try to operate within the law. They, I'm sure they really, you know, they're not trying to get rid of a um, uh, elected government, but what they are trying to do is bind democracy so that we, the people, cannot address whole swathes of issues that have been important to people over the course of the 20th century uh, at the federal level. Um, you know, things from public health, again, to social security, to uh, workplace safety, to, uh, you know, parental leave, all all these kinds of things they they see as threats. So they want a government that is minimal, a government that, <clears throat> excuse me, enforces the rule of law, uh, uh, ensures the national defense, and provides for social order. And more than that, they find illegitimate, and they don't want us to have. And since they know they can't persuade us of that, they would like to change the rules.
Today's episode is sponsored by Madison Reed. Since 2013, hundreds of thousands of women have tried and loved Madison Reed for the way they revolutionized at-home hair color. Amy Errett founded the company and named it after her daughter because the status quo of hair color options either left much to be desired or cost way too much. Madison Reed offers the quality of a salon, the convenience and affordability of at-home hair color, and an ammonia-free formula with ingredients you can feel good about. With beautiful, multi-dimensional hair color, you'll look like you just came from a salon, but you'll have saved a whole lot of time and money because Madison Reed color kits are delivered to your door on your schedule for under 25 bucks. To get started, find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com, and they have a special offer for you as a Best of Left listener. Right now, you can get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit when you use the promo code LEFT. That's madison-reed.com, and use the promo code LEFT. Give us your thesis here. What do these people want? all the way from the Koch Brother Industries and George Mason's bought mm-hmm. university to the Congress and to the federal courts. What kind of society do they want? What do they want to destroy specifically? Right. Well, this libertarian vision shared by Charles Koch and James Buchanan, the economist you mentioned, and the top operatives who are architects of this effort, would like to bring into being a libertarian society. Their libertarian utopia would have no place for essentially the kinds of changes that citizen action has won over the course of the 20th century, really from the progressive era forward. Things like government regulation of corporations to stop pollution, discrimination, lack of product safety, to undercut workers' power to organize together for collective voice, to undercut social insurance like Social Security and Medicare. So it is really an absolutely sweeping vision. It is stunning that anyone would imagine trying to impose this in the modern world because it is such an unpopular vision when people understand it. Only about 3 or 4% of the population at the most identifies with libertarian thought. But because of the money that the Koch Donor Network has and has been able to amass with their hundreds of other donors who have contributed to this, it is actually feasible for them to try to alter the course of our country. And so what I take to be the most significant of my findings is the repeated statement by Charles Koch, by Buchanan, by other key figures in this project that they are acting in the way that they are acting precisely because they understand that they are a permanent minority, that they will never persuade the majority of the population of their ideas in an open contest of ideas. And so they rely on a stealth strategy, you know, to to promote the myth of voter fraud. Right. Okay. Yeah, we're going to get that. But you point out in your book that it's more than traditional libertarianism, because it's not Ron Mm -hmm. Paul type libertarianism. Ron Mm -hmm. Paul does not want concentration of power in a few hands. It seems to be a masked type libertarianism for plutocratic driven policies and actions. I mean, they really want power in a few hands. That's not what libertarians want. Well, they would say that they don't, of course, but their actions suggest very much that they do. And we can see what the combined operations that are Koch funded have done to our country, particularly since the 2010 midterms. You were mentioning the 2018 midterms coming up. But since that period, they have won control over 30 states of the country, obviously over all branches of national government. And in every part of that power structure, they have been pushing measures that undermine the power of ordinary people, particularly workers, consumers, civil rights, feminists, etc., and exaggerate the power of corporations. So I quite agree with you that it's a kind of pseudo-libertarianism, but at the same time, I think it is important to point out that they have, through their monies, co-opted all the major institutions of libertarianism. All the formal institutions of libertarianism in this country now are dominated by Koch monies, Koch network monies, and are pushing this kind of agenda from the Cato Institute to the Reason Foundation, the Independent Institute, and on and on and on. And of course, ALEC and the other groups you mentioned. 
Well, one thing about the Koch brothers is they speak with forked tongues. For example, mm -hmm. they put ads in newspapers that they're against corporate welfare, what they call crony capitalism, mm -hmm. namely taxpayer subsidies, handouts, giveaways, bailouts of business, like the Wall Street bailout. But then on the other hand, they're taking all kinds of corporate welfare. I mean, they have a, a gigantic conglomerate deep in the tar sands, oil and gas in Canada and elsewhere. They have tried to tax solar energy panels by pushing bills in, in legislatures in the South. They haven't been very successful with that. So they don't really walk the talk. They do say that they're for civil liberties and LBGT rights and so forth, but they don't really walk the talk. They have never challenged the military budget, which right. is full of waste of taxpayer mm -hmm. resources. Ron Paul has challenged the military budget. Mm -hmm. They want to close off access to the courts, therefore mm -hmm. restriction on tort, wrongful injury, right. lawsuits, for example. Ron Paul wants to open up access. Mm -hmm. So I like this to have the language really focus on corporatism. This is about mm -hmm. corporatism. They say they're against statism, but they're not. They want the government to serve and enrich them and to deny and impoverish the mass of the people. Don't you think that's really their approach? Well, I think the freedom that really matters to them is economic freedom, right? And this is a cause that is about economic liberty. And I describe it in the book as being committed to property supremacy in their application of these ideas. And so the idea is that the rights of property or corporations should trump other rights, human rights, such as, you know, the right to be free from discrimination in the workplace or environmental protections, such as the right to clean air and water and so forth. So I like to think of it as property supremacy. And I think that is a helpful way of seeing it. I will say, I think there is a tendency on the left to not take them seriously as ideologues. And a lot of these guys aren't, you know, a lot of these guys are on the gravy train for what they can get from it. But I do believe that Charles Koch is a serious ideologue and a serious intellectual in his way, who has been studying ideas for six decades now. He's been funding hundreds of libertarian intellectuals trying to find a way to break through with this strategy. And I think that we have to take the ideas on, on their merits and challenge the ideas directly. And I say that also because they are reaching out in an unprecedented way to young people in particular. They have so much money that they are pushing into campuses, they are funding faculty positions, they are creating centers, and they are bringing thousands of young people into paid internships, into positions in this system, and they're doing that, actually even calling themselves the freedom movement. So I think that it's crucial to really dig into the ideas themselves and show how the libertarianism promoted by the Kochs has actually become a deadly dogma. And I think we see that most obviously in their funding of climate science denial and misinformation. They seem to be on a self-destruction path because if they get rid of Social Security, Medicare, they get rid of government health and safety regulation, uh -huh. they change the tax system so they're rarely taxed, although they're pretty low taxed at the present time. And they basically undermine the democratic pillars of a society, mm -hmm. they're going to shrink the economy. They're going to shrink consumer demand. They don't want a living wage. Well, a living wage means people have more money to spend to buy the products of the plutocracy and the oligarchy. So doesn't that sink into them that authoritarian regimes almost invariably have lower GDP per capita than stronger democracies? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's been true historically all over the world. And if Charles Koch is such an intellectual, and mm -hmm. he's got three engineering degrees from MIT, number one, don't they understand that historically and economically? And number two, if they were really libertarians, they would debate the other side. They would debate progressives. So two mm -hmm. questions. Don't they understand that they are basically cutting the roots of economic prosperity, which produces the quantitative amount of their profits? And why haven't they engaged the other side in debates? Have they debated you, for example? Okay, so two things. One is, as I said before, I believe that these ideas, you know, are, you know, could be fertile, could be useful to think with. But at this stage, given the way they're being funded by this huge Coke donor network and this apparatus of literally hundreds of organizations, if you include the state and the international ones, 
this has it has become a deadly dogma, and I quite agree with you that it is leading to an utterly unsustainable society, certainly environmentally, in that we have a small window to act on what's happening to our planet, but also economically, socially, in, in public health terms, and I believe, frankly, psychically, this would be an untenable society. But no, they seem not to understand this, and I think it, by the crudest measure, in terms of their ability to continue profiting, it's important to recognize that they no longer look to nation states, right? They don't care, frankly, about what happens to American workers or American communities because they're looking to a vast world, to all the consu- you know, millions of consumers in China. You mentioned Brazil and other places. And I think they think they can flourish there. And as I suggest in the conclusion, they've been quite clear that they think America will reach the point when we have Brazilian-style favelas in our cities and we have water water of the quality of Flint in other places. And clearly, they don't care because they think that that will create the incentives and the drive to reinvent capitalism. I think it's insane. (laughs) And that's why I'm spending so much time traveling around and speaking out against it. But I think they believe in it 100%. Now, I will say they do like to debate, but they like to debate in frivolous terms. They like to debate these ideas about as honestly and in good faith as they debate climate science. If you would love a way to financially support this show without it costing you anything, there's good news. You can support the show by bookmarking and using my affiliate link every time you shop with that company online. You know, basically the one company online. Lots of evil tendencies, owned by the richest dude in the world, that one. Chances are you shop there at least now and then, maybe even a lot. Perhaps you make a lot of business-related purchases, I know some of you do. Or maybe you have a standard selection of home goods you get delivered regularly. In any case, you might have some mixed feelings about it, and you'd be right to. But if you do end up using the site, at least you can help siphon off some of that corporate blood money to help support the production of this show. Your shopping experience will be identical to usual, and it won't cost you a dime more. You can get the affiliate link from the show notes on the device you're using to listen right now, or you can find it on the sidebar of the homepage at bestofleft.com. You can bookmark the link so you can set it and forget it while continuing to support us into the future. It helps more than you think, I promise it does, and the more who join in, the more it helps. So thanks for taking the time. The question for our first hour, are the libertarians winning? And by the libertarians, I mean the hard right, the, 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 the Koch brothers, the billionaires, the, 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 the people who believe that American, uh, that, that, that the core values of America are that rich people should get richer and richer and richer, and that's just a fine thing. And, you know, poor people are the rabble, to quote John Adams. I mean, that was his phrase that he constantly used to refer to people that he didn't think should be allowed to vote. People who were not Federalists. Oh, my God, they weren't white male property owners. But are, you know, is, are they winning? Is, this, is, is that what's going on? There's, uh, you know, Trump is pushing... A trill, uh, excuse me, a hundred billion dollar tax break for the ultra rich, in the form of a, a decrease in the tax paid on capital gains. Capital gains. If you buy a stock, say you're a you know you're a billionaire, right? And uh, you put you put a hundred million dollars into Apple stock, and it goes up ten percent over the course of a year. So that hundred million dollars is now a hundred and ten million dollars. You made a $10 million profit. You sell that stock and you have to pay taxes on that. Well, on $10 million of income, well, actually the property, the capital gains tax tops out at, I think, 20%. In fact, they might have lowered it with the GOP tax scam to 15%, but it tops out, let's say it tops out at 20% where it used to be. So you're paying 20% income tax on that $10 million, which uh, is $2 million, I believe. Yeah. And so you're only left with $8 million. Well, you know, they, they, want, to, they want to cut this. They want, they want to say, well, you know, let's say that, you know, there's been some inflation since the time you bought that stock. And this is mostly going to be consequential to people like Warren Buffett who hold stocks for decades. The, the real billionaire investors, the Bill Gates of the world, 
the people who, who buy stocks and sit on them for 10 years. And, uh, you know, they're going to get this huge tax break, $100 billion tax cut for the very, very, very rich. So are the libertarians winning? This is from the New York Times, Alan Rappaport and Jim Tankersley. The Trump administration is considering bypassing Congress to grant a $100 billion tax cut mainly to the wealthy. Steve Mnuchin said, announced that his department is studying this. Mr. Mnuchin said, if we can't get it done through the legislation, legislation process, we will look at what tools at Treasury we have to do it on our own. We'll consider that. Meanwhile, you've got this, uh, there was a, a piece in this morning's Financial Times, in fact, I believe it's the top headline in the Financial Times, suggesting that, or not suggesting, reporting that the yield on 10-year Treasury bonds has now passed 3%. 3% is not the prime interest rate. It's, it's now what the government is having to pay to get people to buy bonds. Why? Well, the article points it out quite clearly. It's because the Trump administration is borrowing like a drunken sailor. My phrase, not theirs. And having known a few drunken sailors, I don't know if they borrow a lot, but in any case, I haven't been a drunken sailor, I guess. Uh, they're, they're borrowing money like there's no tomorrow. I mean, they, they're, they're having to borrow a trillion dollars in the fiscal year that starts October 1st just to fund their tax break for billionaires. A trillion and a half dollars they're going to have to borrow, which means they're going to have to issue treasuries, 10 and 20 year treasuries. And, you know, everybody's getting ready. But what that also means is the cost of our national debt is going up, which is not a good thing. So, in the, you know, this, by the way, is an old scam. This is the two Santa Claus scam being played out in real time right in front of us. This was something that Jude Wininsky laid out back in 1976 in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And he said, he pointed out in 76, you'll recall, those of you who lived through it will recall, those of you who read history will know that this was just a couple of years after Nixon resigned. And... The, and Jimmy Carter was elected in 76. There was this huge wave against the Republicans because of all the corruption of the Nixon years, Nixon taking bribes, Nixon telling lies, Nixon having enemy lists, all this stuff. And, in, and the Republicans felt like, you know, we'll never recover from this. This is the end of the Republican Party. Nixon killed the party. And Jude Wininsky wrote this op-ed for the Wall Street Journal saying, no, 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 no. We didn't, you know, Nixon didn't kill a party. We can bring the party back. All we have to do is convince people that we're Santa Claus just like the Democrats are. And we need to force the Democrats to shoot their own Santa Claus. Jude Wininsky pointed out in this article in the Wall Street Journal back in 1976 that ever since the 1930s, ever since FDR, Americans have viewed the Democratic Party as the party of Santa Claus. The Democratic Party brought us Social Security. The Democratic Party brought us Medicare. The Democratic Party brought us Medicaid. The Democratic Party brought us minimum wage. The Democratic Party brought us unionization. The Democratic Party brought us uh, 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 unemployment insurance. The Democratic Party brought us, you know, basically the entire social safety net and every single element of it was protested and fought tooth and nail by Republicans beginning to end top to bottom. And so then the Republicans, so now the Republicans have to figure out a way how to undo this, right? So this is Jude Wininsky's article. He says, you know, the Democrats are Santa Claus. The Republicans have never been viewed as Santa Claus. And we say, no, we don't like Social Security. This is what George W. Bush campaigned, you know, what he, all around the country in 2005 to privatize Social Security. Didn't work, but he tried. So, you know, and, and Republicans right now, they're trying to destroy Medicare and Medicaid. And in fact, they had this big, this last budget that Trump passed cut $200 million out of out of Social Security. So the wait time when you go on Social Security to get any kind of processing done or any kind of help is going to be much, much longer and you're going to be much more frustrated with the bureaucracy, which is what they want. They want you to hate that bureaucracy. They want you to hate Social Security and Medicare. So Jude Wininsky says, okay, here's how you do it. When Republicans are in power, run up the national debt as hard and as fast as you can. Reagan came into office, there was an $800 billion national debt. When he left office, it was about $2 trillion. He tripled the national debt, or nearly tripled. I think it was $2.1 trillion, $2.4 trillion would have been complete tripling. George W. Bush doubled the national debt. I mean, this is, this is what Republicans do. And this is what Jude Wininsky said Republicans should do. Prior to that, Republicans had always been advocates of, you know, balancing the budget and fiscal, yeah, they still talk about this, right? But not when a Republican is in the White House. 
run up the national debt when you have the ability to do it, and then as soon as the Democrats take control, which they inevitably will, scream about the national debt. Scream about it so loud that the average American is freaked out and telling his politicians, oh my God, the national debt, we got to do something. And then say, wow, we can solve the debt problem. Let's just cut back on spending. We don't need Medicare. We don't need Medicaid. We don't need uh, long-term disability insurance. We don't need long-term unemployment insurance. We don't need any unemployment insurance. (laughs) And on it goes, right? And if you can get a Democrat to go along with that, like Bill Clinton with we're ending welfare as we know it, Or Barack Obama almost chaining the CPI, the the Consumer Price Index of Social Security, doing the chain CPI, cutting Social Security benefits over time. If Democrats go along with it, then then after they have, you point out, hey, that Democrat just shot Santa Claus. But we'll be Santa Claus, Republicans, we will be Santa Claus. We're the tax cut Santa Claus. And it's all one consistent thing. So that's what's going on. And then you use that to gain the political power to completely deconstruct the, 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 the liberal welfare state. So we've got this government reform and reorganization plan. This, this was proposed back in the middle of June. It's on the web, White House website. Under this plan, the government sells off the post, postal service. Sells it off. So if you live in a rural area, it's not going to cost you 50 cents to send a stamp. It's going to cost you eight bucks because you're going to have to do it via UPS. Sell off the Postal Service. Sell off the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. Eliminate more than one third of the U.S. Public Health Corps. So, no, we don't need to be ready for for an epidemic or a pandemic. Restructure all foreign aid and development program and place all domestic programs that help poor families or children under a single agency that has the word welfare in its name. So it's easy to stigmatize all this stuff. There's also a uh, a massive real estate bonanza for developers by selling off private property. Cuts or restructures all the federal programs that are meant to educate people about their financial rights and protect them from bank and mortgage fraud. Cut R&D at NASA. Cut all funding for any form of alternative energy. Put all of this under a single Department of Energy agency. Department of Welfare is created, and all forms of support go through that. Streamline privatization of federal assets via the customer experience improvement capability. Transfer all background checks on federal employees away from the FBI and into the Pentagon. Is this the beginning of a... Ta- this is from Lori Garrett, by the way, a recipient of the Pulitzer Prize. Net impact of the Trump government reorganization scheme is taking everything across government that is for the poor and needy people and consolidating under a single budgetary authority, cut science all over the place, eliminate the Census Bureau, reduce legislation, etc. This is what they're doing. Well, the Democratic Party over the years just uh, basically defaulted. I mean, it allowed this mm-hmm. to happen. You can see it in the Congress. You've written extensively about Congressman Dick Armey in your mm-hmm. book from Texas. And I was watching and interacting with people in, in the House of Representatives at that time. And it was amazing how the Democrats, they ridiculed him, but they never tangled with him because they thought mm-hmm. he was such a nutty former economics professor. There's this ridicule approach that, in effect, gives these people a free pass and a free highway to roar their juggernaut, Mm -hmm. not just from books and articles and ideologies, but into lawsuits up to the Supreme Court and into legislation through Congress. I don't know whether it's kind of hubris on the part Mm -hmm. of liberals and progressives that they think these people are so nutty that they can just be ridiculed with humor on Jon Stewart's program, but not engaged. In the meantime, these so-called nutty people are laughing all the way to the bank. I mean, they're, they, as yeah, you say, I, they control state legislatures, most of the governorships, all the Congress, Supreme Court, you know, yeah. the president. Now, 
Let's talk I could about, not agree um, with you more on that, by the way. It's, it's a deep embedded problem at this point, this ironic posturing yeah. on the left, this being above it all, you know, joking and laughing and poking fun and the sense you get of these people who imagine themselves to be the smartest people in the room who cannot understand that there are others who have a much deeper long-term strategy that is undermining the very ground on which they stand. And I think if we could break through that smugness and break through that complacency, and get people to realize that they may not have all the answers and that other people are building a kind of a chokehold, really, around all the sources of progressive power while they're engaged in their ironic laughter and posturing. If we could break through that smugness, we might just get somewhere. Well put. Where are the Koch brothers and where was Buchanan on foreign and military policy, which we now call the American Empire? So glad you asked that. Buchanan, yes, styled himself a libertarian, detested all of these things that were going on in domestic policy. The phrase his school of thought used for people who went to government to seek anything from old age benefits to, you know, lower class size and better wages for teachers, as we've seen in the red state protest, labeled all of those folks rent seekers, meaning that they were going, in Buchanan's terms, going to government for things that they could not get as an individual from the market. And he described that as parasitical and portrayed wealthy people as the prey of such predators. And these are his words, not mine. So that was his language. And yet he only applied it to domestic groups, right? He did not apply that at all. There was no critique of empire of U.S. foreign policy, quite the opposite. He supported the most aggressive kinds of U.S. foreign policy. So total blind spot, you know, no sense that the military and industrial complex might be rent seeking where the analysis really did apply. So none of that from him. Now, I will say that in the early years, in the 1970s, for example, when Charles Koch was really starting to get active politically and fight Funding, you know, the Cato Institute and trying to build up a libertarian cadre. At that point, he insisted on radicalism, right? And was very clear that they were not conservative. They were contemptuous, actually, of conservatives. And at that point, there was a critique of the military. But since then, they realized that to get anything accomplished and to actually get power, they would have to make alliances with people whose numbers were greater. And that, of course, is the religious right and the broader kind of Republican base. And so they largely shut up about those foreign policy criticisms and those criticisms of empire in order to move that base to push the ball down the field so that they can get the power they want. Although I will say this America first agenda that we're seeing from Trump, this is the old libertarian rights interwar foreign policy. So I think if our journalists had any sense of history, they would begin to explore that a little bit more. And here I think it's really important that we not see any of these entities as though they're islands, right? So the Cato Institute, you know, is connected to ALEC, is connected to the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, you know, is connected to the groups that are promoting the myth of voter fraud in order to disenfranchise people. Is con- You know, I mean, they're, they're all working different pieces of this thing, and yet they can maintain plausible deniability when you try to hold them culpable for their connections to those other pieces of the operation. But I think we see this particularly where they control state politics, as they do in 30 states now, including my own North Carolina. As you've said, there has been no effort whatsoever to do anything serious about corporate welfare, but there has been an effort to devastate the public schools, right, to siphon all this money off to unaccountable, unregulated charter schools, to undermine environmental protection, to take away voting rights, not just from African Americans, the legally actionable case, but also from low-income seniors of all races, from young people in particular on college campuses. I mean, all of this stuff is working together. And I think our journalists have done us, not all of them, there's some amazing people out there, but the mainstream of American journalism has done us a terrible disservice in not connecting the dots for us and not asking the questions that would, for example, help the American people understand.
understand how the Koch agenda is moving through rapidly under the Trump administration. The only place they're really reporting is how much money the Koch brothers are pouring through their political action committees into elections. The Koch brothers, by the way, are open about what they're spending. They're going to spend $400 million for the November election. Where is it on the other side here, on the liberal and progressive with George Soros and others? I don't know. But I do know the press does focus, not only the New Yorker and Jane Mayer, but Mm -hmm. they do focus on the flow of money, Mm -hmm. but not much else. You're quite right. Let's ask about your experience. When this book came out, it was fairly positively reviewed in the New York Times and elsewhere. Have you been on PBS, public radio? Have you been on any of the national talk shows on the commercial Mm -hmm. networks? The only exception is Democracy Now! I was on, and I've been on a slew of radio shows, but about three weeks after publication, and as you said, the book was getting very positive review attention everywhere, you know, in, in lots of leading outlets, great buzz. And then these Koch-funded professors and operatives set to work, pumping smog out into the atmosphere in the same way that they do against climate scientists. And they created this illusion of great controversy about my book and about my research findings and even my reputation. And they created so much smog that it I think it confused people for a time, and I don't know, you know, if this is would be the case, but given the initial reception of the book, it seems strange that it wasn't picked up by the kinds of national TV outlets that you're talking about. But this Coke network is very sophisticated about trying to take out anybody who brings bad news to them, and they actually have a phrase for it that I quote in the book. They call it's an economics euphemism, and they call it raising the transaction costs for the other side. <laughs> Well, so so they actually joke about that. And they, some great researchers, young researchers from Greenpeace and Uncoke My Campus, did a media tracker on the book and found that 91 attacks on me had come from these Coke-funded faculty members and operatives who failed to disclose their conflicts of interest and their dependence on Coke money in making their attacks. But, you know, those attacks created, definitely created some smog. On the other hand, I can say there's also the irony of unintended consequences that in attacking the book as viciously and as vehemently as they did, they alerted a lot of people that this was more than an ordinary book. And lots of people wrote me and said, I saw those guys attacking you and I could see who they were and what they were about. So I got the book and read it. I should say. But, you know, I keep emphasizing how dishonest their Mm -hmm. agenda is because they know full well throughout history what saves capitalism is socialism. That is government Mm -hmm. bailout. Look what Franklin Roosevelt did during the Depression. And they always go to governments all over the world when they get in trouble, these global capitalists, and they want to be bailed out. So this idea of, you know, shrinking government to a level where you can wash it down in a bathtub, the way Grover Norquist has said, is total nonsense. When these people prevail, they're going to prevail by combining the control of giant corporations with control of government against Mm -hmm. the people who have delegated their power to the Congress and state legislatures under the respective constitutions. Well, we don't want to leave the listeners with pessimism here. You know there is an effort of a group on campus to counteract the strings attached grants of the Koch brothers to various universities. There's an uproar now at George Mason University, for example. And second, I'm sure you know Professor of Law Joel Rogers, University of Wisconsin in Madison, he started a group of scholars to draft laws to be submitted to supportive legislators in state capitals, counteracting the ALEC lobby of the Koch brothers. Do you want to discuss that? Yeah, absolutely. And I will say that it may sound bizarre or perverse for me to say this, but I actually feel hopeful at this moment because I think that the crisis that these folks have brought us to, which includes the election of Donald Trump, which would be utterly unimaginable without all that Buchanan's ideas and Koch's money had done, you know, in the run up to that election, that has really woken people up in a quite significant way. And you pointed to two areas that I think are crucial sources of hope. One of them is this brilliant group of young people who have created a group called Un. Coke My Campus. <laughs> they have a fabulous website. They are among the best research on the Coke Donor Network. They're doing organizing on dozens of campuses around the country. We 
where Koch is trying to implant these centers that will be part of the political project. They're phenomenal. So I urge your listeners to check out the website of Uncoke My Campus and find ways to connect with and support them if they're interested. We've had them on our program. Oh, yeah, you have? Oh, good. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize oh, yeah. that. That's great. I only learned about them after the book came out, but I have just been trumpeting them everywhere because I'm so impressed with them since I've met them. And then you mentioned Joel Rogers, and there is actually a broader effort underway now to start thinking about how to unchain democracy with precisely the kinds of measures that you're talking about that we have needed for a very long time since you first set to work, you know, years ago with Unsafe at Any Speed, which is measures to control money and politics, measures to ensure that we have transparency, democratic accountability, and hold Democrats as well as Republicans' feet to the fire on all those kinds of things, things like independent redistricting, you know, all the things that we need to restore and renew democracy and make it real and operative, perhaps for the first time in our history. So I do think there are many efforts underway that are exciting and that people can plug into. And I hope that they will, because I really do believe this is an all hands on deck emergency for the future of our society and our democracy. We've just heard clips today, starting with In Deep, talking with Jane Mayer, who laid out a solid overview of the coke-driven libertarian movement that we all know and love. This is Hell then spoke with Nancy McLean about The Economist, who laid the strategic groundwork of how to change American politics that the Koch brothers are now implementing. Ralph Nader also spoke with Nancy McLean to get into the nuts and bolts of what a libertarian society would look like. Tom Hartman explained the long-running Two Santa Clauses plan the GOP has been running for decades as part of their effort to dismantle the government. And finally, we just heard part two of Ralph Nader's conversation with Nancy McLean, focusing on how the left has failed up to this point to take the libertarian movement seriously and some suggestions of how to fight back. Members will be getting a bonus episode with additional clips on libertarianism, including more analysis of what effects dark money has been having on our elections, a discussion on how closely tied Mike Pence is to the Koch brothers and how he's helping to create a Koch-friendly government under Trump, and two concrete examples of libertarians demonstrating how nonsensical they are based on the policy solutions they propose. To hear all of that, to cast a weekly vote on what upcoming topics you want to hear on the show, and for other details about supporting the show by being a patron, visit patreon.com slash bestofleft. You can find that link in the show notes on the device you're using to listen, which is also where you can find links to each of today's segments for easy reference and sharing. And now to, I think, wrap up the conversation on the reproductive rights litmus test discussion is one last message from my primary discussion partner. Hi, Jay. It's Elizabeth again. Sorry to kind of dominate this conversation. I'm still pro litmus test after hearing the argument against it, and here's why. Um, Full disclosure, I actually work in politics. So I think that we need to, first of all, separate, are we talking litmus test for Democratic voters or Democratic politicians? If we're talking litmus test Democratic politicians, I think they need to be held to a different higher standard. I can also tell you that um, from experience that when a politician comes out with a stance on something, it is not from their own head. There is a lot of discussion that goes on beforehand with staff, and I know this because I'm a part of those conversations, and it's very calculated. And I get that, um, well, I also work in Southern politics, so I absolutely know what it's like to have to try to talk to a very conservative audience about economics when all they want to do is throw out the abortion thing so that they can write you off. Also, we need to delineate between what we're calling pro-life and what we're calling pro-choice. I absolutely respect a politician who will say, look, abortion is not for me, but as a leader of society, I will protect a woman's right to choose. I can respect that stance. I can tell you that, um, My first child, I became pregnant at 17, and I made my choices not abortion. And 
that's you know my personal story however i would never try to take that choice away from somebody else and i think that that was um your first caller who who had that stance and that is very different from being pro-life so if we're talking about your personal feelings on abortion versus your political stance on abortion that is very different i also agree with your second caller i believe it was annie who said make it a litmus test in the primary and then if all you have to choose between is a pro-life democrat and a republican then hold your nose and vote for the democrat i agree 180 percent because as was pointed out you can work with a democrat much more again let's just set aside the idea that that pro-life democrat is going to somehow become pro-choice because they have a change of heart that's just not how that's just not what the process is when politicians change their viewpoints on things we need to make a case for it being safe and reasonable and the right thing for them to come to the side of pro-choice also i gotta tell you that when i was hearing these anti-witness test arguments though very sound and making sense it was really shocking so a uh, little, you know, peek behind the curtain of the sausage factory. There's a lot of Democratic politicians who personally, as human beings, are really racist and really sexist. But when they come to make policy, hopefully they don't bring those racist, sexist ideas to their voting. That's why they have staff to tell them, look, here's here's how this aligns with this core value. Here's how that aligns with that core value. And, and a lot goes into their decision making. Um, you know, our leaders, thank God, are not just uh, making decisions on a whim. Well, except for in the White House, so that's another story. Uh, they're not just applying their own personal beliefs to everything. They're doing research and weighing um, long-term consequences. So the fact that somebody may personally not like abortion doesn't actually change how they're going to legislate necessarily, hopefully. So... I think that we can set our standard not to this person as the absolute bastion for reproductive rights, because quite frankly, in the rural South, that's just not going to get you anywhere. But if we can at least say that they're not going to stand in the way of reproductive justice, then that is what I consider to be the litmus test. Now, if the person is, unfortunately, I have seen this, the politician who says, I am pro-choice or I'm pro-life and abortion of people and you know all the right-wing talking points and also i'm a democrat that doesn't jive if we continue to allow our leaders to say well i am pro-life and i will legislate against the woman's right to choose and excuse that over and over again that creates a landscape of well this is worth compromising also, as a person with a uterus who can't get pregnant, who has quite a big chip in this game, I find it personally offensive to blow that off as, well, I mean, we can't agree on everything. We've got, you know, we've got to throw something under the rug. And it's just unreasonable to, to agree on everything. I'm not talking about everything. I'm talking about my uterus, mine. So, I mean, again, if you, if you change the issue to, say, racism, and you've got a Democratic politician who is, you know, all pro Charlottesville rally and pro all right, and so there's good people on both sides. No, no, but but they're calling themselves a Democrat, so we need to just say, well, we agree on economics, so that's fine. Um, I I would argue that there's an awful lot of people of color who would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I get economics are important, but my humanity is important too. So, again, not equating 300 years of slavery and, and oppression to reproductive rights entirely, because I guess that there's some overlap there. But what I'm saying is, this is not a fringe issue. This is not a, um, we're not talking about banking. Um, we're not talking about any number of issues that don't personally and completely affect a human being's ability to function as a, as a, a free agent of their own body and their own self then there would be a lot more wiggle room, I think. But I, but we need to hold our leaders to a higher standard of understanding what freedom is and what individual liberty really is and what civil rights really is. That it 
infringes upon a person's civil rights to be told by the government what they can and cannot do with their own uterus. And that's a pretty deep personal thing that can't be washed away with, you know, say the banking bill. That was a really, uh, the most recent one where Tim Kaine and Elizabeth Warren went toe to toe. You know, you could say, well, not all Democrats think exactly the same. And in no way do I want all Democrats to think exactly the same. That's why we have lots and lots of them. I mean, if we were all going to have exactly the same mindset and exactly the, the same view on everything, we would only need two politicians ever, one Democrat and one Republican, to argue about everything. But that's not how it, it's set up. We do have lots and lots of Democrats and lots and lots of Republicans, and they fit on a spectrum everywhere. But I think it is totally fair to hold a standard that as a rational society moving forward, we need to set a standard for how we treat human beings. To talk about a litmus test for Democratic voters, I agree that there, um, especially with the, the woman who was just sharing about how she used to be a Republican and that she was able to come to the Democratic side because the Democrats weren't jerks to her. I 100% support that. And as I shared in my first voicemail, um, I used to be a staunch pro-lifer. What changed my mind was not being welcomed into the fold and being excused. What changed my mind was that I stopped being a teenager who was totally brainwashed and I stopped believing whatever anybody from church told me. So I don't think that we're going to get anywhere by being soft on this issue. I think that all we're going to do is continue to fail people with uteruses who don't have choices and are not treated like humans in our legislature, in our laws. We just need to treat all humans like humans. And I think that that's a totally fair line to draw in the sand. Thanks. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks to the volunteers who helped gather clips to make this show possible. Thanks to Amanda Hoffman for all of her work on our social media outlets and activism segments. And thanks to all those who called into the voicemail line. If you'd like to leave a comment or question of your own to be played on the show, you can simply record a message at 202-999-3991. Now, even though I said in the last episode I thought that would be my last thoughts on the abortion litmus test, I will respond to Elizabeth, I think just this one last time, because... I don't have anything else to say on the subject itself. All I have to say is that this discussion has made one thing clear, which is that it is fundamentally unclear what anybody means when they say litmus test. And so if I were to take the position of uh, being against the litmus test, it would be because I don't think anyone should use that term because no one knows what anyone is talking about when they do. So Elizabeth called in for a total of more than 19 minutes. I mean, granted, the last one was the longest, but the first like nine minutes of her voicemails left me with an incorrect assumption about what her true position was, the meaning of her position. When the uh, rubber hits the road, what would she advise a person do? And so maybe that was my fault. Maybe it was her miscommunicating. Maybe it was the time limits of the voicemail. But, you know, we're having a fairly detailed conversation. I think we're relatively intelligent people. I, I think I'm pretty competent at being able to understand what people mean. And when Elizabeth continued to use the term litmus test and say that she was in favor of it, I got an impression about what she meant that now that I have heard her talk more, I realize in retrospect I was wrong about. And so if that's the case, if you're having a a well-meaning discussion between people who are genuinely trying to understand each other and you're missing each other that badly, then uh, I think you just need to have a different conversation. You need to use different terms. You you need to not use terms that need to be constantly defined. And and that's my takeaway of of what this discussion is, that that it's like it's a discussion that is fraught with almost nothing but constant 
defining of what one means by the term you're choosing to use. So if, if that's what you have to do, just skip the term and tell people what you mean. <laughs> that, that That's my takeaway, honestly. When I started this conversation, I had this vague sort of amorphous notion that litmus test was pretty black and white because it mostly gets used with presidential candidates and Supreme Court justices. And in those cases, it is black and white. Do you support the nomination of a Supreme Court justice who is or is not pro-choice? Litmus test. They have to be pro-choice. There is no wiggle room on that. And same with presidential candidates. You pretty much have to be pro-choice to win the primary for the Democrats at the presidential level. And so to me, the litmus test is pretty pretty black and white, like I said, cut and dry. And so when you start having a discussion about congressional candidates or voters or anyone else, and you use the same word that is so often used to mean black and white, but then pretty much everyone in the discussion, I mean, Elizabeth, I think, was sort of the most ferociously pro-litmus test, but she still, she agrees with exactly what everyone else was saying about how, look, like every once in a while, you got to go with the lesser of two evils and maybe have the litmus test during the primary, but not during the general. Well, okay, but so then if there's a bunch of gray area, well, then let's find a different word to describe what we're talking about, which frankly is reproductive justice. Are we in favor of reproductive justice or aren't we? Is that is that a pillar of our values that we care a lot about and we're going to put a lot of weight into? And the answer to that is unequivocally yes, of course it is. And every once in a while, in some extremely red areas of the country, you're going to get Democrats who get in who don't fit that mold, and you're going to be really pissed off about it. And hopefully at the national level, they will be swamped by the pro-choice side. And look, like they're going to be there. They're going to do what they're going to do. They're going to vote with the Democrats sometimes. They're going to vote with the Republicans a lot of times. And that's just going to be how it is. Using the word litmus test, I think, based on this discussion, not even based on any polling, not based on any impressions from other discussions I've heard, based on this conversation with you listeners, has taught me, look, we're not even using the same definitions. I I think that after having heard her talk for about 19 minutes, I think that Elizabeth and I have nearly identical stances on the issue. You might be able to find some daylight between us, but I don't even know where it would be. And I would call my position anti-litmus test, and she would call hers pro-litmus test. So what does that tell you? (laughs) Clearly, it's a terrible framing for a discussion because you, you can end up arguing with someone you agree with entirely and, uh, and, and, you know, we, we haven't, to be clear, we haven't been having an argument here. We are just trying to, we're trying to like find the boundaries of, of these terms and what they mean and, and, uh, you know, how far we should allow the democratic party to flex and, and move. But even in this situation where we're all extremely cordial and not getting emotionally worked up about it very much at all we end up thinking that there's a disagreement where there isn't. So I guess take from this whatever lesson you think makes the most sense. If after all of this, you think using the term litmus test might get you into trouble or just confuse people, uh, I recommend not using it. Uh, Stick with reproductive justice. It's pretty hard to go wrong with that one. As always, keep the comments coming in. The number to dial, 202-999-3991. That is going to be it for today. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to those who support the show by becoming a member or making donations of any size at patreon.com slash left, as that is absolutely how the program survives. Of course, everyone can support the show just by telling everyone you know about it and leaving us glowing reviews on Apple Podcasts and Facebook to help others find the show. For details on the show itself, including links to all of the sources and music used in this and every episode. All that information can always be found in the show notes on the blog and likely right on the device you're using to listen. So coming to you from far outside the conventional wisdom of Washington, D.C., my name is Jay, and this has been the Best of the Left podcast, coming to you every Tuesday and Friday, thanks entirely to the members and donors to the show from bestofleft.com. Best of the Left.